Hello everyone, my name is Dan Miller. I'm from the Utah County Mosquito Abatement Division of the Utah County Health Department. I'm grateful to be here with you to present to you a little bit about aquatic invertebrates. We would, we would rather be at the state park with you instead of here on the internet, but circumstances beyond our control have us here. And so we are going to do the best we can to present to you those things that you would have seen if we would have been at the state park. We'll start with what is an invertebrate? An invertebrate is an animal that lacks a backbone. Examples of our invertebrates are arthropods, mollusks, and anilids, and salinerates. You can see pictures of those over there. Mollusks are your snails. You have uh, different types of arachnids, water mites. Uh, We'll talk about each one of these as we go through. 95% of all the animals of the world are invertebrates. We want to take a closer look at some of these invertebrates and specifically we want to take a closer look at what we call arthropods. Characteristics of arthropods are they have an ectoskeleton, which is a skeleton outside of their body. They also have segmented bodies that they're broken down into. Um, some have two segments, have three segments, some have many more segments than that. They also have what they refer to as jointed feet. Um, the word itself, arthropods, means literally joint, joint foot. Arthro equals or actually is a joint, the word for joint, and pod is the word for feet. And so their names say that reflects to reflect that. All arthropods, all of these critters we're going to talk about are have that one thing in common. About 80% of all the animals named to this point are arthropods, which is more than 1.5 million species of arthropods in the world. Let's look at some of these arthropods more closely. One of those we'd like to look at is the arachnids. Arachnids are spiders, mites, ticks, and scorpions. They have two body segments. One is called the cephalothorax, which is the head in the middle, and then you have the abdomen, which is the other. All the legs, which they have, are eight, are attached to that cephalothorax region. So they have four pairs of legs, uh, the arachnids do. I'd like to share with you a story about arachnia and how they got its name. It's a very interesting story. Part of Greek mythology. Another arthropod we want to look at is crustacean. There are lobsters, cray, crabs, crayfish, some of you refer to them as crawdads and shrimp. I'm going to turn this on so that you can watch the crayfish swim. They have two pairs of antenna, a pair of mandibles, mouth parts, a pair of compound eyes that's usually set out on a stalk, and two pairs of maxilla on their heads. They have followed by a pair of appendages on each of their body segments. And if you look at these, you can see those. Another group that we want to talk to you about are the chilopods. Chilopods are your centipedes. Again, we can watch this little centipede walking through. You notice that he has one pair of legs per body segment. Go ahead and watch him walk. The next group we want to talk about are referred to the diplopods. The diplopods are millipedes and they have two pairs of legs per body segment. Perhaps the largest group of our arthropods are the insecta. Insects um, occupy the very largest group. Examples of insects are beetles, bees, butterflies, ants, mosquitoes, ladybugs, moths, flies, crickets, grasshoppers, fleas, termites, dragonflies, earwigs, and aphids, all part of this very large group but they have some things that, they're, that are in common with them. <clears throat> the characteristics of all insecta are they have three body segments. Um, they have a head or thoracic region and an abdomen. They have one pair of antenna. They have one pair of mandibles or jaw parts. They have two pairs of wings. Sometimes you don't see both sets of wings because some are really small 
or they're hidden underneath another set of wings as the grasshopper would. But when they go to jump and fly, you'll see both wings. And then they have three pairs of legs that are all attached to the thoracic region. Probably our favorite insect here at Mosquito Abatement is the mosquito because we like to kill it the very most. Mosquitoes have three pairs of legs. They have a proboscis, which is a specialized mouth part, which forms a needle, which they use to get their food, both from plants as they <clears throat> grab nectar, and also from you as they're seeking a blood mill to lay their eggs. They have two pairs of wings, but only one that is really very visible. The other is very small. Um, and the females are the only ones that bite us to gain the blood mill because they are looking for the blood so they can lay their eggs. The problem with mosquitoes is they carry some bad diseases that affect us and make us sick. One would be West Nile, which we have here, and Zika, which you've heard about, and malaria, also yellow fever that comes from South and Central America. These and other diseases are carried by mosquitoes, and that's one of the reasons why we need this to control their population. Let's take a minute and discuss the life cycle of mosquitoes. All of them start with eggs. When they need to lay their eggs, this mosquito is laying an egg raft on the water. They use water to lay their eggs. They have to have water to lay them in. Sometimes they'll lay them in the edge of a lake uh, in a muddy area so that when the water floods back in, they can come and the eggs will hatch out. When they hatch, they form what we call larva. And you can see these larvae swimming in this cup. Um, these are literally five or 600 larvae and one small little dipper. And that's their next stage. We call pupa. You can see these pupa swimming. These pupa don't feed on anything. They're just growing. They're going from the larva stage, which is that little worm-like structure, to then the adult stage, which is the adult mosquito, which you are more familiar with. But these are the pupa of a mosquito larva. The next is the adults. And you can see these adults flying here in this cage, um, or they're there. Uh, there's literally hundreds of adults there, and they're actually out seeking for a blood meal. So how do we control mosquitoes? There's several things we can try to do. Well, first of all, you can use repellent. Repellent is really one of the key things as you go out at night so they don't drive you off in the evening. Um, put a repellent on. It will keep them from landing on you and biting you. You can also remove the sources of mosquito breeding sites. We'll talk about it in a minute. And protect yourself by wearing clothing and mosquitoes. Reducing the risk of infection in people by using these repellents. These are several different repellents that you can use. You can also do cover up, wear long sleeve and pants for extra protection. You notice these mosquito nets on these people and they're covered up. And then those kinds of things help us so that we do not have open skin, so that we can avoid being bit by mosquitoes. And finally, we can get rid of standing water. It is my plea that if the mis there's mosquitoes living in standing water around your home, go out and find that standing water and dump it for effective control of mosquitoes. And this will happen. This will help a great deal. The buckets, old swimming pools, now that we're getting into the spring, Go outside and look around your yard. Make sure that there are things, there aren't anything that's holding water. That if there is something that's holding water, to dump the water out, turn it upside down so that we can eliminate that as a source of mosquitoes. So we'd like, what we'd like to do for the rest of the time that we're together is talk to you about the different types of invertebrates you would have seen if you would have been at the state park with us and we'd have given the water samples to look at. So I'm going to go through each one of these different uh, classes or orders of different insects and let you see what you would have seen. The first one we're going to talk about is Ephemeroptera. This means literally wing for a day. These are your mayflies. Um, they spend, actually the adults only spend one day as an adult and then they'll die after they lay their eggs. They spend most of their life as nymphs, they call them, in the aquatic environment, as you see here in these pictures. 
The next group is Ordinata. Um, these are the damselflies and dragonflies. You see them as adults also. Uh, the damselfly differs from the dragonfly and the damselfly will lay her wings back, whereas the adult dragonfly have the wings straight out. The nymphs also look very different. You see here from the damselfly, it looks almost like uh, just a straight stick um, with some tails, whereas the dragonfly nymph looks a little bit more like a beetle or a bug. The next group is the Hemoptera. Hemonop ha, excuse me, Hemoptera. These are easy to identify. If you look on their backs, you'll see kind of an X. Um, I've circled that so that you can see that on the number one, which is a water boatman. Uh, you have number two, which is a back swimmer. Number three is what we call a giant water bug. And though the picture is deceptive, this is really quite large comparatively to the first two, in fact, maybe three or four times bigger. Number four, you see a velvet water bug. Number five, water skeeters, many of you have seen as they move along the top of the water in the summer. And then a shore bug, this is more like a fly. But all of these are hemiptera because they have that nice little X on their back. The next group are crustaceans. We've talked a little bit already about these guys. These are crustaceans that uh, are much smaller and live in the water and you'd see them as if if we had a water sample for you. You have Daphnia, which they call sometimes a water flea. You have the Ustacods there, uh, your Copepods and the um, Amphiopods and then Isopods. All of these you would see, they're very small. You'd need a magnifying glass or a microscope to see underneath them, to see them uh, because of their, their size. But you could, you can see little specks or at least little small parts, especially like the copepod and the isopod. You can see those with your naked eye in the water. Another one is the mollusks. These are snails. Those are pretty easy for you to find. But you'll find those in all of the lakes and the rivers and the ponds, the streams, um, the reservoirs. These are very prevalent in the waters of Utah. And you would find these. Again, this is another example of an invertebrate. Another thing we talked a little bit about the arachnids already, but the, this is what they call a water mite. It's very red, looks just like this. Remember, they all have, all the arachnids have their eight legs. You can see the eight legs very clear with this, with two body segments. The cephalothorax, you can't see what you're seeing in the big round thing is the abdomen. These are the trichoptera, or the caddisflies. Number one, showing you the larva of a caddisfly before it's gone around and picked up the rocks that it will then encase itself in. And these rocks then roll along the waters, uh, the rivers, especially in streams, and we call these rock rollers, but it is actually the, the pupus form of the caddisfly. And then it will merge out as you see it in number three, two different species of the adult caddisfly. Uh, a lot of fishermen use this, um, the caddisfly as an adult, also even as the larva to look for and catch fish. Uh, Coleoptera, these are uh, easy to identify also because these are referred to mostly as your beetles. Um, they have a straight line down their backs. And if you look closely at number one, you can maybe see that. Uh, I've circled number three, which is your water scavenger beetle, really quite large. And it's got that nice line running straight down its back. And so where the wings come together. So the coleoptera are very easy for you to determine or see. Uh, number two is a crawling water beetle. And then number four is a diving beetle. All of these you'll find um, somewhat into, in around aquatic environment. The tiger beetle, not so much in the water, but uh, the other three you do. Finally, we have the dip diptera. The diptera are your flies. They, um, there's quite a few of those here. Uh, which the mosquitoes fall into, which we don't have an example of, which I already talked about. But you have the crane fly. Uh, many people call these a mosquito eater. They don't eat mosquitoes um, and they're not a big mosquito. They're just a crane fly. Fungus gnats are very small. This moth fly has the antenna that look like a moth, wings that are kind of hairy, but it isn't a moth because it doesn't have two. It has this uh, one set of wings and the others are very small. Uh, number four you have is a 
Phantom Midge. Number five in the, is a Dixid Midge larva. That's what you would see in the water. Um, and I just wanted to show that to you. Number six, a black fly. Number seven, a siphon fly. These will be around your houses. You'll see them in the seven around barns. Eight is a horse fly, very big, bites, uh, very aggressive. Um, nine is a midge fly larva. And so midge larva looks like that, very different from what a mosquito larva looks like. Number 10 is a deer fly, uh, very aggressive. They like to bite and you get out there. And finally, a noceums. Noceums are extremely small. That's why they call them noceums because you don't see them. But they also bite like a mosquito and draw blood. Um, a lot of times in the early spring, late fall, people have mistake bites from noceums as they think they're bites from mosquitoes. Thanks for watching. Have fun finding these fun aquatic invertebrates. As you look at this last one, maybe try to figure out what it is. It's one we've already seen. The only thing it is, is you have a bunch of eggs attached to its back. Thank you very much.